334. Okay. Um, now, I would say on this, I asked you to do a graph, and the real point of it, I, I guess I will a highlight. Um, and uh, it's not so much about a detailed graph as it is understanding the shape. All right. So let me uh, begin by reading that uh, problem. Let's see, number uh, 68. In fact, I hesitated. The, the graph is so important that I picked this problem to be part of the homework. It's actually, by the way, the last lab. You guys have one more lab to do. And we're going to actually then measure this. We're going to get exactly the shape that uh, this one shows. So it's really the shape and the understanding here. Uh, so let's take a series uh, RLC circuit. So I will uh, start by drawing an AC. I'll put an R and then an L and then a C. And so there's my RLC circuit. And they, they give us some numbers so we can work on them. And it's connected to an AC source and it has a voltage of one volt RMS. It says, make a precise graph of the power delivered to the circuit as a function of frequency and verify that the full width of the residence peak at half max is this value. All right. So, Let's just get an equation for the power first. Okay, so uh, the power would be uh, and they don't say in let's see, did they say average power, power delivered to the circuit? So I'm gonna write it as I squared R. Okay. Now, let me pause and talk about the current. That would be the voltage over the impedance for this series RLC circuit. So we've done a number of problems today with this series one. So I'll just kind of jump right to the equation that it's the square root of R squared plus XL minus XC squared. So if I square it and get I squared, I'll get V squared and I'll get an R squared plus an XL minus an XC squared. And so let me use that in here for the power. So power, again, I squared R. So here's the I squared. So this would be a V squared over a R squared plus an XL plus an XC squared. Um, and then the R, I guess I'll just put up there. Now, here's what they're, they're asking in this problem where it says, make a precision graph of the power delivered to the circuit as a function of frequency. Okay, so uh, it's not so easy to see the way I've written it, but each of these reactants, oh, sorry. is, a function of frequency. And when you look at this and you say, okay, what is the power as a function of frequency? The numerator is a constant. Okay, so maybe I'll just to understand this graph, put constant in the top. Oh, the bottom has an R squared, and that's a constant. Now, some other constant, perhaps, but still a constant, plus 
And this is the interesting functional part. There is an omega L, and then there is one over omega C. All right. So knowing a little bit about mathematics here, we might ask ourselves what this function would look like. So if I plot the power and I plot it versus the frequency, and I'll, I'll just do angular frequency, okay? Let's see, do they say frequency or angular? Now they technically say frequency, but there's kind of a nice way of working with this one. But let me do maybe two rough sketches here. But when I bring this equation here, I can begin to see, and let me ask myself, what would happen if the frequency is small, like, like zero? Uh, what would happen if the frequency is really big, like millions or billions or trillions? And what might happen in between? And so I hope you see here that if the frequency is small, ah, right there, one over small, this would be an enormously big number. And of course, this would be really small. So maybe in my mind, I'll just ignore this and say, let's look at that. And it's huge and you square it, so we don't have to worry about the negative. But I got a huge number now in the denominator. So that means the power is really small. So I would actually technically get zero power at zero frequency. And maybe you might say, well, as the frequency increases slightly, the number is going to get a little bit bigger than zero, it's still going to be small. Because again, if this is not a zero, but it's still small, this is just a big number, it's not infinite. And so a constant divided by a big number is some, some small number. Okay, so, so this is kind of what I would expect uh, at zero and small frequency. Now, what about large frequency? Well, again, you kind of see the same effect for large frequencies. This one would be one over something large. That's pretty small, that's like a zero, but this one's really big. And so maybe I'll ignore the capacitor effect and just look at the inductor. But again, at high frequency, that's a big number. And you square it, it's even bigger and it's in the denominator. So that makes the power small. So I would think that way out here at high frequencies, I might get something maybe a little bit like this shape, where the, the higher the frequency, the, the more it asymptotically approaches zero. See, the, the higher that frequency is, the bigger that denominator keeps getting, and it gets closer and closer and closer to zero. It never really actually gets to zero, but it gets closer and closer to zero. And then notice that as I get to lower frequencies, you know, th th this number would get smaller, still be really big, but it'd be smaller. And since it's in the denominator, it's gonna make the power a little bigger, but it's still gonna be kind of on the small side. Now, notice something else. Notice that the largest this thing could ever get would be at a magical frequency where these two cancel off. See, the denominator is this constant squared, which is, which is R squared, plus this amount. And this amount can be zero. That's the smallest it can ever get. It's a square. So it can't be negative, but we're adding a, a number. And if that number is zero, that's as small as this can get, which makes the denominator as small as it can get, which makes the power function as large as it can get. 
So at this magical place, and I would say the magical place then is where omega L equals one over omega C, or if I rewrite this, omega squared is equal to one over LC, or omega equals one over the square root of LC. At that magical frequency, and so on my graph, I'll just put it right here, one over the square root of LC. That magical frequency your author calls omega naught. Okay. And so if our circuit is operating at that magical frequency, we are going to get the most power. I'll put it up here on my, my graph. And it would then tell me that my graph would increase up and get closer and closer and closer and closer to that magical value. That would be its peak, and then it would taper off of it. And the reason we call something like this as a tuning circuit is because of the shape of this graph. That's really the main point of this problem is to say that if you have frequencies that are either low or high, you won't get much current. Come back up here, here's the current, or actually this is the square of the current. I guess this is the current. But if you have high frequencies, X sub L, the reactance of the inductor is high. If you have low frequencies, X sub C is high. And so the current is being blocked by the inductor at high frequencies. It's being blocked by the capacitor at low frequencies. There is a magical frequency where these two devices kind of cancel each other off. That's where this comes out to be zero. And that's going to give you the most power. So that's the, the, the magical frequency. And so this is called a frequency selector circuit because it really only consumes power uh, or has current when your frequency is somewhere near this magical value. Too low, no current. Too high, no current. Near this value, yes, that's when we get a lot of current. In fact, we can even Talk about how much power that is. Coming back to this equation, when that frequency, you know, is, you know, one over the square root, that number and that number are equal. So that's a zero. And so I get V squared over times R divided by R squared. Uh, one of the R's would cancel. And so your maximum power would be V squared over R. Okay, yeah, that makes, I, I didn't think about it mathematically at first. So I was just thinking about what you said in lecture about the back EMFs created from the capacitor and the inductor. Mm -hmm. So I drew that general curve. But I forgot okay, about and that I, one. Right, and I think you're, you're fine. Your author does this. I mean, I'm looking at the uh, solution. He uh, decides to plot an omega divided by omega naught. And so he rearranges this equation, but let me not do that because I think that will throw things <laughs> for a loop, if you will. Okay, and then how would you go about the second part about um, verifying that the full width of the resident peak oh, at the half and Okay, and then, you know, as a side note, if you wanted to be more accurate, I would say put this into a graphing calculator or Excel and, you know, watch it print out. I've done that a number of times, but I, 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 I'm not recommending that just because, you know, actually, maybe I should rephrase that. What your author says is, you know, he says, don't try to solve this analytically, put it in a uh, spreadsheet and just let, let it plot. So your call 
Oh, okay. Okay. Yeah. Um, and then he says, get the numbers by it. So let me, let me see if I can get the numbers without doing kind of what he suggests and do it more mathematically. I'm hoping it's not too uh, mathematics, but um, if you are looking at half the power, so um, he, here's where as, a, as an engineer or a scientist, you run into troubles because you can see why we call it a, uh, a frequency selector because it per prefers one frequency and if you get off of that, it's still okay for a little bit, but if you get too far, there's very little power. But notice it doesn't really just all of a sudden become zero. You can't say, okay, it lets just this frequency. And when you get to this, it lets nothing. I mean, it doesn't look like, <laughs> uh, you know, this where, okay, it lets all these frequencies come through at the same power. And then when you get above this frequency, it just shuts off. <laughs> like step function or something. <laughs> yeah, so it doesn't do a, a step function, but what we can do is give it some kind of equivalence, and that's what this is saying in, in, the, in the second part. The second part is, says, make a precision graph of the power delivered to the circuit as a function of frequency and verify that the full width of the resident peak of half mass is okay what they mean by half max then is if you come down this power curve until the power is half as much so v squared over 2r you could come down either side v squared over 2r so in other words if your frequency is higher than this magical frequency you'll get less and less and less and less power and there's some frequency here where the power is half of its maximum. So I will call that omega high, <laughs> okay? The other direction, there is a frequency, again, kind of maybe starting at the magical frequency, the most power, and moving over to lower frequencies, omega L, you get less and less power until you get to this, magical power that's half as much. And so they are saying, how wide is this width? <laughs> you know, uh, how far apart is omega high compared to omega low? <laughs> okay. Yeah, I think I would have to put that into like, like Excel. To be yeah. yeah, now they're saying do it by Excel, we might be able to worry about the quadratic on this, but maybe we can get this by saying, all right, when does my power, so I will say power time omega at either omega high or omega low, okay? That would be when we are half the maximum power, and we already said the max power would be V squared over R. Okay, so let me write V squared over 2R here. And let me come back here and say, all right, this is the equation for that power. So let me write this as V squared times R over r squared plus, and if you'll let me for a second, just write uh, x l minus x c squared. And let's see what we can do with that. Certainly the V squared can cancel off, move this over. And this becomes an R squared plus an XL minus XC squared. And this becomes a two R squared. Now, good, I think it's gonna work out well. 
Uh, then I can say that the XL minus XC squared is just an R squared. Uh, then I can say that the XL minus the XC equals, and technically it's plus or minus R. Now here's where I got to put in, this would be the omega L minus one over omega C. plus or minus r. So by the way, one of them, and I'm not sure which one yet, but one of them, the plus r would correspond to omega high, and the other one would correspond to omega low. Okay. Yeah, so now here I need to do a little bit of manipulation to get uh, omega Uh, by itself. Uh, you can get a common denominator with um, omega L and omega like to multiply it by omega C. Yeah, so I'll go omega I low times C. So this would be omega I low squared and an LC minus one equals a plus or minus R. Uh, moving this over to here would be plus or minus omega, either high or low, C or R. And then this is going to be my omega squared. And I'm going to okay. I'm going to take this I'm debating here if I should do this now or later. But see, that LC is something that's really close and smells a lot like my magical one. Because I want to know how wide this is here. But yeah. well, let me hold off. Let me not put anything in there quite yet. I'll just call it LC, okay, plus one. All right, so let's see what I, what I have here. Uh, if I write this as omega, either high or low squared, and I'm gonna put the LC kind of in a group. I'm gonna move this one over. So now this becomes a minus plus. And then I'm going to put the omega HL, and then this would be CR uh, minus one equals zero. So now I have a quadratic equation. So omega, either high or low, would be the opposite of B. So the opposite here could be either a plus or a minus of CR. Plus or minus um, B squared. This would be C squared, R squared, minus four times A, which is LC times C, 4AC, and that's a negative one, all over two A. And uh, you know, like I said, I'm pretty sure why this is why the author did not ask us to prove it mathematically. Um, why don't I
we'll write this in terms of Okay, let me start with the, the C. Um, this first term, the C in the bottom will cancel with the top. So I will have an R over 2L. The other option what if I put I'm not sure I like where this is going either. Seems like a lot of simplification to get to what they're asking for. Oh, you know what I oh, you know what I should do? Yeah, I'm I'm trying to actually prove it. They actually help us out here and give us a number. Maybe that's what I should do. Okay, so so let's do let's do this. Let's say that the frequency h would be the magical frequency. So the high one would be the magical frequency plus half the width. See, they're saying verify. They didn't say prove. Okay. So it says verify that the full width of the resonance peak of half power is this number. So in other words, Take their number, which they're saying is R over two pi L. So they're saying that's the distance from the low frequency to the high frequency. And let me just take half of this, okay? So if I take half of that, And I add it to the original frequency. So the original frequency, uh, remember, one over the square root of LC plus R over four pi L. And so if I come back to that equation here that says put this frequency into here, and you should get half of the power. Well, I'll tell you what, let me not do the whole equation. Let me just do this bottom piece right there. If I take omega L minus one over omega C, and I put this in, this becomes one over the square root of LC plus R over four pi L times an L. And I subtract one over, oh, this doesn't look so good either. Um, Now I'm kind of in a tough pickle here. There's a lot of other ones I'd love to have time for. So would you mind if I just kind of stopped here and said, look, they're not really asking you to prove it. They're asking you. Oh, to yeah, I, I, I'm glad I was, I mean, my initial drawing was just based on like the conceptual piece. Okay. I, since it just said precise, I, I thought I was probably missing something with the math. Yeah, no, 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 no. Like I said, this is it's got a lot of math in it, and I'm not doing a good job over here. And I, 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 I don't think our time is well spent doing that. So I'd kind of like to jump back to the other problems. That's okay. Yeah, it just seems like a lot of algebra. So. Yeah. Okay. 
that answered that question. Thank you. Yeah, perfect. All right. So there's, uh, we'll call that 68. Um, but now it got me curious. So maybe tonight when I'm got some free time, I'll play with that algebra. But it, that's what they're asking. Okay. So why don't I come back? Well, tech uh, Zoom, see if you guys see any other questions, but uh, Janet asked a lot of them. So let's go back to number 27. Time here, 27. And it's, oh wow, it's already four o'clock. Okay, so let's see if I can do this a little better and quicker. Uh, 27 says what? Uh, 27 says that uh, an AC voltage of this form, so they have V equals 100 volts, so that would be the maximum sine uh, 1000 T, so that would be the angular frequency, 1000 T, is applied to an L, uh, RLC circuit. Assume that the resistance is 400, the capacitance is five microfarads, and the inductance is a half a Henry. Find the average power delivered to the circuit. Okay, so I'll go back to kind of where we started the last one, it would be, uh, I squared R. So there's the average power. And of course, the real key then is to find the current. And so the current is the voltage uh, divided by the impedance. Uh, now, I do want to be a, a little careful here. The average power you get by squaring the RMS currents. And I didn't uh, specify which currents uh, we should be squaring. Is it the maximum or is it the, the RMS? And it's the, the RMS, that's why, we, that's why we had the RMS because the RMS stands for, it's the square root of the mean of the, of the square. And so the mean is kind of an average effect. So if you want to get average power, you need RMS current or RMS voltage, okay? So that being said, I want over here RMS voltage in order to get RMS currents. See, they gave me the maximum. So I need to take the 100 volts and divide it by the square root of two. That's going to give me the RMS. So I don't want to overlook that. Okay. Now to get the impedance, that's this R squared plus this XLXC, the reactance of the inductor and the capacitor squared that we've been talking about. And of course, square root. Now, the truth is we want the current squared. So why don't I just say, what is the RMS squared? Because that then would be, eh, it might be nice just to find the current. What do they ask later on? Well, they don't, they don't ask anything later on. Okay. But I'll just find the, the current. So I've got this number. Let's see. And I believe they gave the R value, 400. Okay, good. Now, what they did not explicitly give is the XL, the reactance of the inductor, or the XC. So like some of the other ones we did in the, the last session, uh, we need to calculate these, these out here. So the omega is that 1,000. 1,000 times the L, which they say is a half a Henry. So I guess I didn't need a calculator for that one. That's 500. And then down here, this omega would be 1,000. And the, the C is five microfarads. 
and then take the uh, reciprocal and we're at 200, okay? So with those numbers in mind, maybe I'll just subtract them in my head, XL minus XC, that's 300 and then I square it. So three, oh, that's nice. But I think 300 squared plus the resistance of 400 squared is a perfect right triangle of 500, right? Yeah, okay. So all of this gives me an impedance of 500. And so my current RMS is this 100 divided by the square root of two divided by 500. So I'll go 100 divided by the square root of two. So there's the RMS voltage. Let me divide that by 500. We're looking at a current of about 0.141 amps. Okay, so now I can finish the problem by taking that current and squaring it and also multiplying it by the resistance of 400. And it looks like eight. So I squared R, that's RMS squared is about eight watts. Yeah, and uh, uh, yeah, so 27 doesn't have one of these long multiple parts. And let me just check, make sure I didn't do anything wrong here. They got eight watts also, nice. Okay, so we'll call that good, a number uh, 27. All right, so next one, although let me just check the uh, Zoom here. I see uh, Gabriella came in here. Well, uh, so Gabriel, I could put, uh, well, maybe you just want to watch or you got a question, throw it in the chat. Oh yeah, I have a question, sorry. I, I just got back to school, so I'm still opening my question ah. up, sorry. Ah. Yeah, no problem. Uh, let me let me get started on this next one I have, and then you, uh, I'll take yours. Uh, Thank you. All right. Um, let's see. So let's do forty-one here. So number forty-one, and we'll start this at four eleven. Now forty-one. Oh, we get to a transformer. Okay. So a transformer, as the name implies, transforms the voltage or the current. So it doesn't doesn't change the power. But as a quick kind of summary of this, uh, what it has is this kind of this coil effect. So as the current comes in, it makes this flux, which is a magnetic field, which I'll kind of represent in green. And then if you take another coil, so called the secondary coil, and wrap it, you are going to then get an induced voltage in the secondary. And so the voltage in the secondary is connected because of how much voltage you put in the, the primary. In fact, here's how we solve that. We say, let's look at the EMF in the primary because we know that would equal to negative the number of turns times the change in flux in the primary. And if we apply Faraday's law to the secondary, oh, well, maybe I better put a little P here for primary, the voltage in the secondary would be negative the number of turns in the secondary times the change in flux in the secondary. And it's impossible to do exactly, but we can at least talk about it theoretically. If we wrap one coil inside of another, then all of the flux in the primary gets directed into the secondary. So if we rearrange this and say energy, or sorry, EMF of the primary over the number of turns in the primary equals, and we arrange th that would be the number of the amount of flux change. And if we are saying it's equal to the flux in the secondary, then we could say this is equal to the voltage in the secondary over the number of turns in the, the secondary. 
And so this is why we call it a transformer because the voltage in the, the secondary has changed by this factor of this ratio of the number of turns in the secondary compared to the primary. And so if you have more turns in the secondary compared to the primary, this pre-factor is greater than one. And so your voltage in your secondary is greater than the voltage in the primary. You've, you've transformed it. We call these step-up transformers. We can also build step-down transformers by having uh, a larger number of turns in the primary than the secondary. And so this pre-factor is less than one. And so when you multiply it by the voltage in the primary, you get a voltage in the secondary that is less than the, the primary. And that's the whole idea of stepping it down. We have that much less. Okay. All right. So now that I talked about transformers here for a moment, here's what they're saying. A transformer has 350 N1s. I think they mean the primary there. And 2,000 in the secondary. If the input voltage is given by this amount, so E primary is 170 times cosine of omega T, what is the RMS voltage developed in the secondary? Okay, so to get the voltage equation in the secondary, I would take the number of turns in the secondary, divide it by the number of turns in the primary, and multiply it by this voltage of the primary. And in our case, uh, let's see, this was a 2000, and the number of turns is 350. So when I multiply it by 170, this is going to give me the EMF or the voltage in my secondary. So I have 2000 divided by 350. So that's a step up by about a factor of 5.7. And so that means I will have about 971 times cosine of omega t. Now, I'm not quite done, but that's a big first step. That gives me the mathematical equation for the voltage in the secondary. And this problem said, it said, uh, what is the RMS? All right, so voltage or EMF of the RMS is actually the maximum divided by the square root of two, at least divided by a square root of two for a sinusoidal wave. I think you were asked to show that you would divide it by the square root of three if it looked like a sawtooth wave as shown in number uh, 50, which I guess is also on the list. So we're gonna get to that one. But if I now take that value and divide it by the square root of two, I'm looking at 600 and I'll call it 87 volts as the RMS in the uh, secondary. And they got, same thing, nice. Maybe I won't tear that paper all the way off. I'll just say, hey, let's look at number 42. And, uh, oh, uh, Gabriel, hang on just a second. 42 is a lot like 41. So let me knock that one out. I'm gonna come over you to Gabriel. Uh, but uh, 42, then let me, let me read that one. here. And actually, let me mark the time here. 42, uh, it's 418. 42 says a step up. So there's that word again. A step up transform is designed to have an output voltage of 2,200 volts RMS. And a primary is connected with a 
110 RMS. Now, let me, let me write that down again. The voltage of the secondary is equal to the ratio of the number of turns with the, you know, uh, sorry, I got it backwards. Uh, number of secondary compared to the primary of the voltage in the primary. Uh, come back here. That's what we just derived here. So this uh, number of turns in the secondary compared to the number of turns in the primary. That's the prefactor that goes in front of the voltage of the primary. Well, like I said, this could be a number greater than one, so it's a step up, or it could be a, a step down. So this is a step up. Clearly, we're going from a lower voltage, 110, to a higher voltage, 2,200. And then it says, if the primary windings, oh, and this is an unfortunate mistake here. There is not the rest of the problem listed. I bet that was a mistake when my laptop was copying these. It's easy to miss when it's on the next page. Uh, let's see what the rest of this question said. I'll just get out the hard copy instead of trying to call up the PDF. Sometimes I lose the zoom when I do that. Um, but let's go to the problems at the end of chapter 33 and 42. Yeah, see the rest of the problem, and there's quite a bit to it, is on the top of the next column. It says, if the primary winding has 80 turns, how many turns are required in the second day. Okay, so this I guess would look something like this. Uh, let's see, the secondary has 2,200 for its RMS voltage. The number of turns in the primary, it says here, the primary winding has 80, so we'll put an 80 here. And this is the 110. We can solve for question A, what is the number of turns? In the secondary, so 200 and, or 2,200. Or maybe I'll just go times 80 when I bring this over and then divide by 110, and that would be 1,600. So 1,600 would be the first part of this. Uh, the next part of this, part B says, if a load resistor across the secondary draws a current, of one and a half amps, what is the current in the primary? Uh, assume ideal conditions. So what they mean by ideal conditions is that we have, as I tried to draw in the last one, a transformer where all the flux from the primary goes into the secondary. And so what that would mean is there's no loss of energy. So the current in the primary times the voltage in the primary would need to be the same as the current in the secondary times the voltage in the secondary. So we were told that the voltage in the primary is 110. We were just given that the secondary, let me confirm that, was one and a half amps. As if a load resistor is connected to the secondary, draws a current of one and a half amps, okay? Uh, what is the current in the primary, okay? And of course, the voltage in the secondary is this 2,200. So the voltage is going up. 
from the primary to the secondary. Notice that the current will be going down. Then. In other words, we'll have a lot more current in the primary because it steps down to 1.5. So when you talk about a transformer stepping up or stepping down, it has to do with the voltage because the current is exactly the opposite. Because you don't get free energy out of, you know, out of it. If you increase the voltage, you've got to decrease the, uh, the current. And so that would be the 1.5 times 2200 then divided by 110. And so we're looking at 30 amps in the uh, primary. Now, I think the last part I saw, they said, well, you might not have an ideal one. Yeah, so part C says this, it says, okay, what if, if the transformer actually has an efficiency of 95%, what is the current in the primary when the secondary has a current of 1.2? All right, well, let me just, go like B where we have this perfect match that the energy coming in equals the energy coming out. What they're saying though, is real transformers don't work that way. We do our best to get them to work that way, but they don't. So the truth is what comes out in the secondary is a fraction of what went into the primary. And we do our best to get that to be 100%, but that doesn't always happen. And so they're saying this transformer is 95% efficient. So that means 95% of the power going into the primary equals the power in the secondary. And then they're basically just asking the same question as B, what is that current in the primary? So I'll take the voltage in the primary to be 110. Uh, they do change the current on you. Uh, in B, they said the current was 1.5 amps. And so now they've given us a smaller amount of current due to the inefficiencies here. And then we still have the 220, uh, sorry, the 2,200. So after a little bit of calculator work, let's see what we get. 1.2 times 2,200 divided by 110, divided by 0.95, we're talking about a current of 25.3 amps. And uh, that makes sense that it's lower than that, only because they're, well, they're after a lower amount. But it would have, if they had left it at 1.5, it would have gone, have gone up a, a little bit. All right. So there's 42. Let me check the uh, solutions here on 42. Let's see. They said 1,600 windings. Good. Uh, they said 30 amps. Good. And they said 25.3. Ah, good. All right, nice. All right, let me, let me cross that one off the list. One, two, three, four. So we still got four on your list. We're getting towards the end of time, but uh, uh, Gabriel, did you uh, want to work in here? Because I know that uh, some of these 122 can be really long. So if you... Yeah, thank you. Uh -huh. So for my first question, it's uh, actually out of the book. Okay. And it's number 84 for chapter, uh, oh, one second, sorry, for chapter six, yeah, 16. Chapter 16, okay. Um, and, yeah, and question 84. Um, okay, uh, let me 
look that up. Now, I don't have a hard copy of you guys, that one at home here. So let me call up PDF on that one. Um, let's see, Kirkpatrick, right? Okay, here we go. Nice, okay. Uh, and then you go to chapter 16. Actually, let me go to chapter 17. It might be easier to go backwards. So we'll go to 17. And I'll go back to 84. Well, that's kind of small. Let me make that a little bigger. Okay. Now, uh, oh, I should have asked, them, but I kind of assumed this was not uh, one I signed on the PDF, right? Uh, no, this was yeah. not. Okay. So let me try number 84 from the uh, PDF here. Uh, but 84 says, how long is an open pipe organ with a fundamental frequency of? Now, let me draw your attention to a couple of videos I sent out. And I believe it would be the last chapter, and it would be problem number 24 and 25. What's relevant here? from that chapter is that when you draw a wave pattern, so let me draw a standing wave pattern, but let me point out that I'm going to avoid for just a moment dr drawing the beginning or the end of this wave. Okay, now I have to stop it somewhere, but I, I want you to realize this is not, uh, my intent was to draw this infinitely long wave and then say, here is our question when it comes to waves. If waves are created in this tube, then this edge right here, would it be a node or an anti-node? Uh, uh, is it open? Yeah, and it's open. An anti-node. Yeah, good, good. So this end has to be an antinode. So I'm going to put an AN for antinode. Now, what about the other side? Is it also open? Yes. Now, let me pause there because I know it's open because here's what it says. And this can be a little confusing. This is why I wanted to point it out. It says, how long is an open pipe organ? Okay, now, any sound coming out of a pipe one end has to be open automatically because the sound has to come out. So know that one end is always open. The question remains about the other end. And that's why they say in the wording an open. If the other end was closed, they would have called it a closed. And so what I'm getting at is everybody knows, well, okay, maybe I should say everybody doesn't really know, but... I'm going to tell everybody, one end has to be open. When they describe a problem and they say it's open, what they're telling you is the other end is open. So this has this is opened on both ends. Okay, thank you. And that, that's the key to read that. That it's open on both ends. All right, so both ends have to be anti -new. All right, now looking at this pattern, and I'll just put a dotted line down the, the center. I'll find an anti-node and represent that as one end of the pipe one. And I'll draw it in green. All right, so there's green. So there's one end of the pipe one. Where's the other end? Well, the only requirement is the other end is an anti-node. So maybe in a different color like red, I'll just point out where they could be. It could be here, could be here, could be here, could be here, <laughs> could be here. And there's no limit to where it could be. So let's just find a pattern. So how far is it from this 
green line to the red line. Well, in terms of wavelength, it's a half a wavelength. So the length of the tube could be a half a wavelength. That's one option. However, remember I said there's a lot of options. So how far is it from this green line to maybe this option of the red line? Well, that's one. One wavelength. Now let me write one as two halves. That'll help you see the pattern a little better. What about the next option? <laughs> Three. Well, yeah. And Three. so after you draw a couple of these, you will begin to see that the length of the pipe organ can be any integer, let me just call it n, times a half wavelength, where n can be a one or a two or a three or a four, dot, dot, dot. Be any integer. Okay, thank you so much. Okay. Now, they do say something very important. They also use the word fundamental. Now, keep that in mind. That means the lowest frequency. Now, here's why that's important. Let's talk about the frequency. The frequency is velocity divided by wavelength. Let's take this pattern that we just talked about and solve it for wavelength. All right, so I'm gonna move the two to the other side. So that means I have two L. I divide it by N, and that equals the, the wavelength. Okay, so let me put that into here. So this would be the velocity. And if I divide it by wavelength, that would be two, L over N. Uh, now, if I do a little mathematics, remember this is a compound fraction, so I can flip and multiply. So this would be N over 2L. And that's really the formula I want to use because it says, what's the frequency? That's the question. What is the frequency? No way. I'm sorry. That's how long. So I want this L, how long? Okay, but they gave me the frequency. What about the velocity in the end? Well, here's where we gotta kind of read into the problem a little bit. The velocity would be the velocity of the waves in this pipe organ. Uh, they're sound waves, they're in air, and they're probably near room temperature. You know, if somebody was playing a, a pipe organ, uh, most likely the air is, you know, in that room at room temperature. So I'm going to say that as far as velocity goes, we're probably looking at about our standard. 343. Yeah. So 343 for the standard velocity of sound in air at room temperature. Um, the N is the part that I was trying to focus your attention on because you can kind of see that as N gets bigger, the frequency would get bigger. And so we've got to figure out what N we have to use. And that's where that word fundamental comes in. Fundamental means the lowest of all the possibilities, the lowest one is what we call the fundamental, and the other ones are all then multiple hires of that. We would call them harmonics in a, in a musical sense, in a musical world. So this N, that word fundamental is giving away what the N is, the N is one. And of course, the frequency is this 493.88. And so now I need to use my calculator. All right, so to solve this for L, I'll take the 343 times one, not real useful, uh, divide that by the two, and then I'm gonna move this frequency over here. So I'm gonna divide by 493.88. 
and get a length of 0.347. And I've done everything in meters. So maybe I will finish by saying it is 34.7 centa. OK, length. thank you so much. And then uh, I have another question mm -hmm. on your lemma double check on uh, 13 for the homework this week. 13 for the homework. All right, let me also bring up you guys' homework for this week. Let's see, 102. Uh, what did I do with you guys? Ah, all right, it's coming up here. And uh, let's see, this week was chapter 17, yeah. So chapter 17, oh, so it gets us into uh, optics here. Okay, uh, and say it again, what was it, seven, what number? Chapter 17, number... Number, um, number, ah, sorry, 13. Number 13. For exercises. In the exercises. Okay. So let me write down a time, 440. Good. All right. So number 13 here. Uh, chapter 17. Let's see, what does that one say? It says a four. Oh, okay. Okay. Uh, uh, I might have to, do, just for my own sake, not for your sake, I might have to, I'm going to have to redraw these triangles. But um, what I, I hope you got from the lecture is I went through these triangles uh, in. In, in class so that you'll write them down and have them for the test, okay? So keep that in mind because the triangles and the mathematical pattern of the triangles uh, varies depending on what kind of mirror we have and where it's located, all right? Uh, and that's why I could never keep them straight and uh, I, uh, Ultimately, I would encourage you that you'll just kind of learn the physics and you'll do what I'm going to do. But for the test coming up, because um, as I said in the, in the lecture, and you're touching on it, the two hardest things of this semester you just touched on. But one is those standing wave patterns. And the other one is this, this optics with drawing these rays and coming up with our proportions. All right. So let me uh, read this one carefully here. They say a four centimeter tall object is located 75 centimeters from a concave mirror. So let me start by making a concave mirror and drawing what we will call the principal axis or the optical axis. And it says that the focal length is 25. So if I make from the mirror to this point, call it F, then that's supposed to represent 25. And the object is 75, it would be three times this distance. So one, two, three. So drawing it the best I can to scale, and I'm not gonna to try to measure anything by my drawing, but I want it to look halfway decent, okay? Then this point where the object is uh, and how far out is what we call the distance of the object. And then its height, and just for simplicity of drawing, I'll make a little arrowhead. Let me call that then H, the height of the object. So, th so this is my first step. Uh, how tall is the object? That's H, so that's four. 
And then where is it located? Well, it's located 75 away from a curved mirror, a concave mirror that has a focal length of this distance, which is 25. And this says, draw the ray diagram to find the location. Oh, you know, technically they're saying actually draw it accurately and then you can just measure it, but uh, I'm gonna do the math. Uh, but uh, let's draw the ray diagram. So maybe to change color so it'll stand out, I'm gonna draw the first ray in green. So the first ray in green comes across, hits the mirror, and this is what we mean by the focal length. The focal point is the place where the light, when it hits the mirror, will bounce off and go through. Now, the other ray that we like to draw is the one that goes through the focal point, hits the mirror, because that one goes straight back. And so in other words, this one that I'm drawing now is the reverse of the first one. See, the first one went parallel and then through the focal point. And since the law of reflection is the same thing in reverse, we can draw the one that goes through the focal point, hits the mirror, and goes parallel. Okay. So somebody standing over here, looking at the light after it bounces off the mirror would have concluded that these two beams originated from right here. So this is where we say the image is. And so if I draw the arrowhead now, upside down, this person after looking in a mirror like this would say that the image is in this location. You might say that the image would be a little further away from the observer than the actual object itself, but not as far away as the mirror. And they would also say it's upside down and they would also say it's smaller. But let me also put some symbols here. Let me call the height of the image, H prime. And let me call the distance that the image is from the mirror as image distance. So here's where our geometry comes in. Um, let me change colors again and see if it stands out. Uh, I'll do a blue. But if I were to draw a blue line across where this ray goes through the focal point, down the object, across the principal axis and to the mirror, I'm hoping you can see that I have two blue triangles. And here's the best part of these blue triangles. And put here blue. Those two triangles are similar. I, I know that because the definition of similar is if they have all the angles the same. How do I know they have all the angles the same? Oh, well, remember when a two lines cross, this angles that they make, which we call vertical angles, although mine kind of looks horizontal, so don't let the name mislead you. But these are called vertical angles. They have to be equal. And then we have right angles. So at least two of them match up. And if you also remember that all three angles have to add to 180 degrees, that would tell me then the third angles have to match up. So this is my proof to you that these two blue triangles are similar. Well. What's nice about similar triangles? Well, you could take the corresponding leg and write a ratio of them. Watch. So this smaller blue triangle, this little part that's kind of in the mirror was drawn straight across from the image. So this would be the height of the image. So let me write it as height of image. 
its corresponding part for the big blue triangle would be this one, which is the height of the object. So what I'm saying here is the height of the image divided by the height of the object, that's a ratio of these two legs, would be the same as this part of the blue triangle, this length versus this length the part that's on the optical axis. So now this part is the focal length. This part might be a little harder to see because it would be this whole distance, which we call the object distance, with the focal length subtracted off. So, so this length of the triangle would be object distance minus focal length. So I'll say it again that, and I'm only halfway there, getting to this point was a lot of work and uh, you should do it for the homework you should study, but for the test, you should have this just written down next to you in your notes saying, all right, if I have a problem like this, then this is what the triangles come out to be. And uh, there's one, two, I think three different options. So I would have all three of them ready. And that's why in the video lecture, I go through all three so that uh, you can have them on the board and you can have them on the video and you can write them down. Now, let me do another set of triangles. Let's see, what colors have I not used? So I've used green, I used blue, I used red. Um, what, what might... I got a black, but the black might be too close to the blue. Um, this blue might be too close to the blue. I'm gonna go with this orange, although it might be too close to the red, but I think it's the best option I got. Or maybe this light blue. Yeah, maybe the light blue. Oh, it's pretty close. It's actually kind of close to the green compared to the blue. But I, I, but I well, which one stands out better? The orange? Yeah, maybe the orange does. Okay. <laughs> All right. Well, trying to get a color that's going to stand out compared to the colors I already got. Let's draw a set of orange triangles. And I'm going to do kind of the same thing I did for these blue ones. It's getting kind of messy in here. But what I'm going to do is draw the image and along this line and up along the top and the line connecting them. And so these, the set of orange triangles right here, and maybe I better just make it a really solid orange one. I got everything on top of each other now. Hopefully we'll, we'll stand out. But I would say the same logic that this smaller orange one is similar to that bigger orange one. And then because of that, I can do this ratio thing. And let me put it in the same order. The height of the image compared to the height of the object. And so looking at this, this would be this side of the small triangle, the vertical side, and the vertical side of the big orange triangle would be the same as this length is to this length. So let me do this length. This length might be a little hard to see because the whole length all the way back to the mirror is the image distance. And so if I subtract off the focal length, so image distance minus focal length, I would get this distance. And then I would divide by this orange one, and that's an easy one, that's just the focal length. Ah, well, I'll say it again, it took me a while to get these formulas. And let me emphasize on the exam, don't take the 5, 10, 15 minutes to get these. You should write these down and make a note that this is the mathematical pattern and then just write for con cave mirror if Object 
is greater than focal length. Because again, go to the video lectures, you'll see that I run through this. And if the object distance is less than the focal length, we get a slightly different set of equations. And if the mirror is convex, we get a slightly different set of equations. So those are the, the three options I was saying. And so you're gonna to want to have those handy. All right. Okay, thank you. So there's those two and then the third one. Oh, no, that's okay. So that's all we need is those two. Okay. Okay, so watch now I'm actually ready to do the problem. And so what I'm saying, if this was a test problem, start here. Because watch this, here's the first step of math. Since these two are equal to each other, I could just write, Focal length over object distance minus focal length equals image distance minus focal length over focal length. That's what I get when I take those two equations, set them equal. And the best part about this is everything except for image distance is given. And that's what the question is asking. The question is asking, what is the image distance? So I can put in for focal length 25. For object distance, I can put in 75. For focal length, again, I can put 25. For image distance, I can leave alone. That's what I want to solve for. For focal length, I can put in 25. And for focal length here, I can put in 25. And so if I kind of simplify this, 20, uh, 75 minus 25 is 50. So this would be 25 over 50. Now, 25 over 50 is one half. So let me write that down first. Now, if I bring the 25 over here with the one half, that gets 12 and a half. And if I bring the 25 to the other side, I get 37.5 for the image distance. So one of the questions of this one said, here we go, uh, draw the ray diagram and find the location. So there it is, I just found the location. 37 and a half centimeters from the mirror. Okay, thank you so much. So I should just like write these formulas and when to use them for the test. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Because this, you don't want to take the time to derive them, and nor is it kind of expected. Like I said, this is uh, the two hardest things we do this semester are this step and the one you asked about a second ago, the, <laughs> the sound tubes. Now, let me make sure I finish this, this problem because the other half asked this question. It said, uh, what was the other half? Oh, uh, what is the size of the end? And uh, coming back to these original equations, I could use either one of them, but uh, I'll just use the top blue one here. This says the height of the image, that's what I'd like to get, over the height of the object, that was four, equals the focal length, well, that was 25, over the object distance, well, that's 75, minus the focal length, well, that's 25. And then maybe I'll just simplify that because again, 75 minus 25 is 50. So this is 25 over 50. Well, that's a half. So I'll just write one half. And then when I bring the four over and multiply by a half, I get the height of the image as a two. One before. Oh, sorry, one sec. Yeah, no worries. So there's your two. I'm kind of the end there. Sorry, my the the cleaning lady just finished ah. and she wanted to tell me something. Sorry. Okay. No, 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 no problems there. All right. So anyway, so that's the, 
the last step is just to take the four times a half and the two. Um, you're muted. Are you saying something? Oh yeah, sorry. Uh, will there be anything like this for convex mirrors? Uh, yes. So um, the convex mirror, um, of course, curves the other way, and these change just slightly. So I would write then that formula down. Or if you want me to work out a video, I, I, I will. Uh, let me not do it now. Oh, and by the way, I should point out that it, it kind of sounded like you were rushing home from your school to uh, catch me in time. I don't know if that was the case, but uh, you know, know that uh, you, you know, if you don't catch me live here on a Friday, you know, just send me an email, I'll make a video of it. Uh, okay, thank you. But uh, the other thing is the, convex mirror will have these equations slightly different. And like I said, I, I'll have to work through them or look them up, but I would write here for a convex mirror and then have the formulas because there are problems like the next one below it, number 15, basically asking you to do the same thing, but with the convex mirror. And I'm gonna say, you should probably try that one on your own where you look at my, my video lectures and you find that formula. And so you start right here. And then you just, you just gotta plug it in and solve for where is the image and where is the object. In fact, the convex mirror is kind of nice because you don't have this qualifier. You don't have a qualifier that says, if the object distance is greater than the focal length, the geometry works out the same no matter where the object is. So you can just say for a convex mirror, period. And so that's kind of nice. There's not like two options. So the concave is a little harder because it's got two options. It's got one option if the object is greater than the focal length and the other one if it's in front of the focal length. But the convex has just one set of formulas. And so if you ever read a problem, like number 15 that says, hey, this is for the convex mirror. You can just look at those and say, oh, got it. This is it. I'm, you know, I'm golden. Great, thank you. Yeah. Uh, yeah, that's all my questions. All right. Awesome, yeah, those are, that, 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 that's uh, really good ones. Bye, have right. a great day. All right. You Thank do you. here. All right, Chin, let's see. If I come back over here to the Zoom, it's getting late here. I want to make these for you. Uh, why don't we do one more? How about we do number 45 and then give me a little break and I'll make your other ones, which was 47, uh, 50, and 57. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll make those video recordings and uh, and uh, send those out uh, separately. Okay, so let me do uh, chapter 33, number 45. Oh, I want to better write down the uh, time here. This is 5.03. Okay, good. All right, so um, let me just switch back to your class. That's not it. Oh, here we go. Uh, what is 45? I wonder, is it more transformers? Oh, ah, no, no, it's uh, filters. Ah, okay, let, let me say something as I get started in this filter. It looks like uh, 45 and 47 are good ones to do, but I think I say this in the video lecture that um, I will not put this on the test, the filters. We, we just don't have enough time to do it justice. Um, so it won't be a test question, but I do like to keep it as a homework one and have you guys think about it. 
Um, and you would get more into it when you guys take your next class on circuits. If you take your next class, it depends on your major, but uh, uh, the circuits class would be taken by, let's see, electrical engineers, uh, aeronautical engineers, uh, uh, physics majors. It would probably not be required for mechanical engineering. Uh, probably be encouraged though, because a lot of your mechanical engineering uses them uh, for sensors. Um, and, and this would be a good example of that with a filter. So it'd be encouraged, but not required probably. Um, I doubt if your industrial engineers or your fabricational engineers are required, but again, couldn't hurt. Uh, probably, probably required for transfer or something. Uh, other physical science, probably not for you chemist people or you uh, meteorology, um, astronomy, but again, all of it would be helpful. Uh, anyways, with that in mind, let's see if we could do this one. It says, uh, consider the circuit shown in the figure. Well, let me grab the uh, book here so I can kind of uh, look it up my, myself, but uh, I believe, it's what we call an RC filter, looking at what the equation uh, looks like here. Um, 22A, ah, here we go. So 22A looks like this, that you have an AC source, first it runs to a capacitor, then a resistor, and you measure the voltage across the resistor. Okay, uh, keep that in mind because this sounds an awful lot like problem. Uh, what problem did we have an LCR circuit in series? And then we were asked to find the voltages between like A and B, B and C, C and uh, D. Um, hmm. Yeah, I got so many papers over here. Oh, all right. Well, I'm not sure which problem that uh, was. Actually, I could probably scan up and see it. Yeah, oh, there it is, 24. So, so this is a lot like 24, if that helps anybody. Um, but let's try this 45. Uh, in fact, I might even say it's easier than 24 because we only have uh, two elements. But here's the AC. Uh, here's the capacitor. Uh, here's the resistor. So you can see why we call this an RC filter um, because there's only two elements, a capacitor and a resistor. Okay. And we're trying to find the voltage, what they call the voltage out, but it's really the voltage across the resistor. So here's what I really want to say. Voltage across the resistor would be the current in the circuit times R. And of course, we did an extension of this on number 24, where we were asked for what's the voltage across the inductor, what's the voltage across the capacitor. Uh, here, we're just asked for the voltage across the resistor. Um, so with that in mind, I need to find the current. And the current would be the voltage divided by the impedance. Now, part of this needs to be saying, um, what voltages are we talking about? Um, we could be talking about RMS, but we could also be talking about maximums. The good news is it won't matter because they're asking for a ratio. So, um, our little filter here in A says it's you know, gonna be the, the same thing, uh, whether we're talking about the ratio of the maximums or the ratio of the RMSs. So uh, I won't even specify then whether I'm talking about the RMS or the maximum, but I will specify that I'm talking here about the voltage input. In other words, this is the voltage that's being generated by the source, and I'm trying to find the voltage on the resistor, and the voltage on the resistor is the output. That's probably far more important than talking about whether it's RMS or uh, maximum. Okay, 
So the input voltage divided by the impedance would be this square root of R squared plus XL minus XC squared. Now, in this case, there is no inductor. So this one can be eliminated from our equation. In fact, you can see XL equals omega C. We, we, we have no L. And so I'm just going to drop that one right away. So our current really is voltage in divided by the square root of R squared plus XC squared. And I'm going to use that back up here and say, OK, the voltage output, the voltage on the resistor is this current. So let me write the current. And then multiplied by the resistance R. And now I can just move the voltage input to the other side. And I get the ratio they're looking about, how much voltage out compared to what you put in is equal to, and in the numerator we have an R, and in the bottom we have the square root, and I have the R squared, and the X sub C is one over omega C squared. And that's what they wanted us to show. So we did show that the ratio of the output voltage to the input voltage is given by this equation. Now, here's why we call it a filter, though, is because in part B, on another page here, uh, parts, page two, part B, uh, says this, uh, what value does this ratio approach as the frequency decreases towards zero? So as F approaches zero. Now there's two ways we can look at this. Uh, the physics way is to say, wait a minute, as, as the frequency approaches zero, this is really just a DC circuit. And now we have an RC with a DC circuit. And we did a lot of that in chapter 28. So we know that what happens is the capacitor fills up with charge and blocks any more current all the voltage is on the capacitor. There is no more current, so there's no voltage on the resistor. So you should get zero voltage on your output. So that's what this should become when the frequency approaches zero. Of course, the other way to do that is mathematically, and you can hopefully see that mathematically, that right here, if this frequency gets really small, you have one over small. One over small is big. And so if you have big in the denominator, then you have one over big. Actually, it might look more like this. It might look like R over the square root of R squared plus one over small. And I'll say it again, one over small is big. And so we get one over big. And one over big is small. And so we're going to get a small voltage. And if it truly goes to zero frequency, we will get zero voltage. And that totally agrees with our conceptual physics part of it where the capacitor would build up and block it and you'd have no, no current. So this is why it's called a, a filter. If you have low frequencies, you don't get any voltage out of it. You only get voltage at high. And so this little mechanism, if you had a bunch of frequencies coming in here, after you ran it through the filter, the low frequencies would not show up on the other side. You would only get voltage for the high frequency. So we call this a high pass filter. It only lets the high frequency. If this, had, if this was related to say a stereo system 
and you had all these different frequencies from the really low frequencies, which would be your bases, to the high frequencies, your troubles, after running it through this filter, you would only have the high frequencies. And so you probably would feed this to your tweeter because your tweeter is designed to play only the high frequencies. And it's just a waste of power and a waste of energy to send the low frequencies to it. Um, you would send your low frequencies to your woofer and you would do exactly the opposite of that. Because remember, if you don't have the voltage on the R, you must have it on the C. And so we can use our RC the other direction. And in fact, that is exactly what I just described for problem number 46. It's not on my question list, so I'll, I'll pass on it. But if you were to do the same thing, but this time you would put voltage out, so a little hint towards number 46, and you would say voltage out, which is the voltage on the capacitor would be I over XC. You would calculate I exactly the same way, but in the numerator, instead of having the R, you would have the one over omega C and the R would be gone. And so you would get exactly what they just did. I guess I just actually did the whole thing. And so maybe I'll even put here in my notes, number 45 and number 46 because that's exactly what 46 is. And then 46, because of this, you would get a voltage when the frequency is low. And so this is called a low pass filter. More technically, it would be a low pass RC filter. And you would connect it to your woofer speaker. So you would get, you get sound out from your, from your woofer. So that's the, the idea of that one. All right, well, like I said, your list, and I appreciate your list. It's just kind of getting uh, late in the uh, day here. Oh, it looks like uh, 47 is exactly that word. An RC high pass filter shown in figure number two has a resistance of, um, but uh, yeah, maybe before we, since that one's so close, and 50 and 57 are distance. Oh, let me, let me, let me, let me do that one too. Um, this one is just like number uh, 46 uh, because it is exactly the structure and then it's just asking us to uh, plug it in. So maybe I'll say, all right, let's uh, try. Now that I technically did number 46, even though it wasn't asked, uh, let me go and say, okay, here is 47. So 47 says an RC high pass filter shown in active figure 33.22A has a resistance of 0.5. What capacitance, oh, now, wait a minute, they say A. Oh, my bad. I'm sorry, I used my terminology wrong. Okay. Um, wait, pretty. 3A, yeah, yeah. So, okay, so you only get voltage when there's high frequencies. Uh, did I say that? Yeah, okay. So uh, when the frequency gets low, you get very little voltage, small. Okay, so you only get a voltage at the high ones. Okay, I, I guess I did say that. Um, so this is a high pass. I don't know, I, I might've used my words wrong. Anyways, it's a high pass. It's letting, 
It's letting the high frequencies go through. And so if you hook your tweeter up to here, that's why you would do that. Okay, so this is an RC high pass filter as shown in 22A. Uh, then it says the resistance R is a half of ohm. What capacitance gives an output signal that is half the amplitude of a 300 hertz input signal? Okay, so for this one, we can actually use the result that we just calculated here. Um, of course, I crossed it out when I did 46. So let me go back to uh, 45. And so 45 says the voltage of the output divided by the voltage of the input would be R over the square root of R squared plus one over omega C squared, okay? And so what they're saying here in this one, it says what capacity, so we're looking for the value of C, gives an output signal that is half the amplitude of the 300 Hertz input, All right? So they're giving to me the frequency and they're saying the output right here is one half of the input. And so that's really nice. The input would cancel off and you get one half. Okay. Um, and then of course, for the resistance, they have a one half, uh, they have a square root and uh, this would be a 0.5 squared plus a one over omega C quantity squared. Um, why don't I get, Well, that's a one half and a one half. Why don't I just cancel those? So I get one equals one over the square roots of all that stuff. And again, since it's way past uh, quitting time, let me just not write it out and just square it. So that's one equals one over, and then I'll just square it. So that'll be a half squared plus one over omega C squared. Move this to the other side and even squaring one half squared is one quarter. So I'll go one quarter plus one over omega C squared equals one. Uh, move this to the other side. One over omega C squared would then equal 0.75. Uh, taking the square root, so the square root of 0 0.75 is 0 0.866, and uh, maybe moving the omega over here, so times a 2 times a pi. Uh, times an F, and they said the frequency is 300. Okay. And so one over C is 1,632. And then finally, I can answer is what is the capacitance? So let me take the reciprocal. And so this is 6.16 times 10 to the minus four. Maybe I'll write that as 616 times 10 to the minus six. So I can write it as 616 microfarad capacitance for oh, A. Oh, there is a, a B here. Uh, I should check uh, B here. Uh, but let me check the answer. 600, okay, they got 613. So within some rounding, good. And then it says in B, uh, what is this ratio for a 600 hertz? And it says you can even use this result from step 40, uh, problem 45, which I guess I already did. So the ratio or fractional output to input, so how much it passes, would be 0.5 for the resistance. 
divided by the 0.5 squared plus the one over and the omega now would be two pi. And so we're at a higher frequency in part A we just did, it was 300. But now they're asking us at a higher frequency. Now remember this is a, a uh, high pass filter. So I think we should get a larger percentage out. See, in part A, we got a half a percent. So now we're looking at a, at a higher per percentage uh, and 616 microfarads. So that whole quantity squared. Okay, so why don't I calculate this? I already got the capacitance in here. So let me multiply it by a two and then a pi and then a 600 and then take the reciprocal of that. So that's this number downstairs. Let me square it and add it to a 0.5 squared. And also taking the square root of that is the number in the denominator. So I would have 0.5 divided by that number in the denominator and I get about 75%. And so again, this fits our point of, an, of, an, of a filter is that it, it lets more of a particular frequency. This is a high pass filter. So, so this is letting the higher frequency. So it, it, it only let half of the voltage of the 300 get through. Now that we've gone up to 600, we're letting in 75%. And I guess I should check the numbers and yep, they match. All right. So again, there's our filters. Those are really good three problems with filters. But like I said, um, we're getting a little too much into the circuits and a little away from the science and more into the engineering. It's neat stuff. And hopefully you guys will find it uh, enlightening. And that's why I wanted you to do it, but it really is probably best not to put that on the exam, but to leave something like that for a deeper discussion when we get into our, our circuits uh, class. All right, well, I'm gonna call it stop now. This is uh, getting an hour past our stop time, but I got two more. I'll make those later tonight or maybe uh, tomorrow and then uh, shoot those out and you guys will have a, a, a lot of these done here. I will then exit on up here.